Okay, so Japesh, your topic was Brahma Charya. Yes, I will get started. So the, I think, general understanding of Brahmacharya is related to um, celibacy. Um, but according to Ananda Marga, the correct meaning of Brahmacharya is to remain attached to Brahma. So whenever people do any work externally, uh, usually they look upon the object with which they come in contact as a finite entity. Um, because of their constant aspiration for material achievement, their mind is so engrossed in material objects that their consciousness becomes crude. The meaning of practicing brahmacharya sadhana is to treat the object with which one comes in contact as different expressions of Brahma and not as crude forms. Uh, so by such by means of such an ideation, even though the mind wanders from one object to another, it doesn't get attached from Brahma because of the cosmic feeling taken for each and every object. This will lead to desiring the infinite versus the finite. Um, many have misinterpreted brahmacharya to mean the preservation of semen. The word Brahma or charya has no relevance to semen. The old understanding maintained that the preservation of semen or prevention of its surplus increase one's energy and leaves the mind undisturbed. Um, so if the correct meaning of the word brahmacharya is accepted, that is to feel the cosmic entity in every material object, control in life becomes essential. But such control doesn't imply disobeying the laws of nature. Control means to abide by nature's laws. So there isn't any restriction to marriage or uh, sexual desire. The main point is to maintain control of our desires. Marriage is a natural function, such as the desire for food or sleep. A lack of control in any of these areas will result in negative consequences. The need for marriage does differ from individual to individual, so every situation is different. Some are more suited for marriage than others. If um, if a marriage would result in, uh, let's say, negativity, then there's no point uh, to, to even consider uh, marriage. Uh, so in conclusion, one must exercise control in every aspect of life. Uh, such control does not mean killing desire, but controlling it. Desires and tendencies are a nat natural function and part of life. In case of enjoyment of any material object, the control over the subjectivity is called brahmacharya, and the control over objectivity is a parigraha. Okay, does anyone have any questions? I actually have a question. I don't know if anyone um, knows the answer to this, but from the the explanation in the book, there is a lot of um, discussion about semen retention. What about for females who don't have any semen? So what what did that mean? Um, like talk about preservation of vital fluid. Um, is this specifically only for men? Or what, what is the sort of uh, approach women should take or how, how should they be understanding how brahmacharya was under generally understood? I guess it's more in relation to, to the, the old understanding of brahmacharya. Does anyone have any thoughts about that? You might be the essence of the only female here. 
when you read it, did you did you ever have any questions about how you were supposed to understand it? Well, I think it's it's yeah, it's the the old understanding, but in uh, Ananda Marga, it's it's completely different meaning. So the the old one doesn't make sense in this context. I guess the, the, the Ananda Marga explanation is um, it's much more inclusive of both sexes. So probably not even a consideration. Yeah, and also that um, it's about uh, seeing um, seeing the divine in every object and just keeping this mindset and um, it's like meditating in a mundane life going through life and meditating so when you return to when you start meditating in the evening you are already in that uh, mindset and um connection to to the consciousness so it's much easier for you to to meditate because you've been meditating actually the whole day but my own what do you think Um, yes, I I agree with that. I'm just thinking about the idea of um, like restraining yourself because um, well, we it's just you know something to discuss probably because I saw multiple examples when people try to restrain themselves. It always leads to negative consequences because you if one restrains themselves in i don't know in the desire to eat food and they want to eat food they at least they become um angry which leads to ex some excessive negative emotions that can um, lead to you know uh, worse to, to that can worsen the relationship with others or that can lead to for instance I don't know um, to a situation when someone starts drinking alcohol even though they didn't drink for a while you know what I mean so restraint is not the answer uh, that's probably my my point that's what I've, I've been pondering so rerouting is is the way, right? Yeah, they call it channelization or sublimation. So the, the, the entire idea that Freud came up with was the psych psychodynamic theory, that basically uh, most of the psychological elements and even some somatic or physical are the result of uh, the repressed uh, mental or psychological uh, desires that found that were repressed in other words they they were not expressed in any suitable form so as far as i understand like you're saying tantra is rerouting or some subtleization making everything more subtle and kind of uh, expressing all the expression towards the divine uh, the divine the supreme so greed uh, for food, for example, or for sex can be channelized because it's not, those things are natural. They can be channelized towards the Supreme. And of course, um, they, every person will have to adjust differently. Uh, means physically. So it's very important to be able to find socially appropriate avenues to do that. Because some branches of Tantra don't advocate, they are quite antisocial in their ways of expressing it. 
So we have to find ways to subtly do that, say, through spiritual practice, first and foremost, through art, and through, I would say, self-knowledge through psychological approaches. Yeah, what do you think? It's an interesting topic. Yeah, I agree. Yeah, I think I agree. that's a very good point. I think this uh, channeling is, is, is the main idea. Um, because I personally, I uh, I realized that I have some addiction to sugar and it's it's really hard to get rid of. And when I try to get rid of it just by eliminating it in my diet, it always leads to me... Uh, I don't know, unconsciously trying to, for instance, watch, uh, entertain yourself, like watch a movie, for instance, when I would prefer logically to do something for personal development, if that makes sense, no? So uh, just cutting something off just doesn't work. And I saw that in in people who are, who has some kind of, who were religious, I would say, when they just try to get rid of something, you know, to fight something directly, that almost always leads to excessive anger or even amplified negative emotions that just pop up somewhere else. I'm in the text he, he does briefly go go into how um monks certain monks in the past um were exploiting the population through um i guess misteaching these these principles so in order to control a population you you need to have their sort of fear or inferiority complex at the surface so they did that by um making them think that these let's say sexual activities or even uh let's say urges were wrong but was a sin so then a lot of the population they were they were married people so to think that your natural urges your your actions on a regular basis are a sin it, it does um, bring about these these negative uh, feelings of inferiority, and you know, not to judge, but I do see that in a lot of the the mainstream religions today. Um, you know, I've spoken to a lot of people. I went to to uh, Christian school too. You know, a lot of um, these natural urges are seen as sins. So, you know, can't help it, but sort of conclude that the purpose is to maybe control versus liberate. And, and I think that's why I'm so attracted to these yogic principles or these ways to approach spirituality. There is um, sort of a path to, to liberation versus i think the the bondage that the the other traditions might might promote what are you aditya any any thoughts on the topic I guess moving on. Anyone have any uh any any um hello, can you hear me? Yes, Aditya. Oh, Namaskar. Nice. Namaskar, guys. Uh you know, uh there is a saying that uh, everything is known by comparison. Uh, so uh, th this, uh, all these ideas, they're they're also um, 
need, need to be known by uh, a certain comparison. For example, if there is too much of something, that's not good. If there is too little of something, that's also not good. Saying that if uh, you follow your urges too much, that's not good. But if you don't follow it at all, that's also not good. Uh, you, you see my point? So there, there, there has to be some happy medium. And of course, for every person, that happy medium is going to be different. Uh, but that, that's how it works. Uh, that's my opinion. What do you think? Yeah, I mean, it seems like every everything in the universe is, is seeking an equilibrium of some sort. You know, anything yeah, that that's the out of balance. Equilibrium. Yeah, so maybe that's that's what we're sort of moving towards as well. And uh, also, uh, I was just thinking that uh, that equilibrium is going to be different at uh, uh, different points of uh, development. Uh, I mean, spiritual development. Uh, because uh, what is, uh, you know, what is good uh, at, at one uh, point in time may not be good uh, at the other. Uh, so hmm. it's, it's very individual and also it's going to vary. That's my thinking. Uh, what do you think, guys? I, you know, I think, um, I guess the, the context makes a big difference too, because um, uh, relativity versus, let's say, uh, an absolute truth. Because um, in different situations, different times, different, um, well, times in history, you know, what is right is is not right at another time and, and vice versa. So it's almost like what maybe what we're seeking is what what is the, the absolute truth in situations where it doesn't matter um the context that there is a uh, an absolute, you know, that that's not relative. In other words, something that is quite ideal, so uh, it will not have a context. Uh, is that what you mean? Yeah, something, something, I don't know, something that sort of underlies or even uh, surpasses the, the, the context. Hmm. Uh, yeah, the, the, that's something... Uh, it's like a benchmark, uh, right? Uh, but that benchmark again needs to be practical and applicable uh, in our life. Otherwise, mm, might not be useful. Yeah, for sure. But you know, sometimes the the way of life is, is what's messed up. And uh, to, to try to sort of um, adjust to to sort of uh, an imbalanced society, right? You, you, you might sort oh, of... Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. A society, yeah, you know, it, might, it, it, it may, makes society. a big difference all the time. Because, uh, for example, uh, in uh, our tradition, we don't eat meat. But the majority of society, they're meat eaters. And, mm -hmm. Yeah, so to be normal, you sort of have to eat meat, right? But, <clears throat> well, norm, normal. Yeah, uh, and uh, we are uh, abnormal uh, according to the society views <laughs> and opinions. Yeah, I guess throughout history, the truth always was. It's almost like the truth has always been persecuted in a way. Oh, yeah. <laughs> the, the, that's, uh, that's quite true. Okay, does anyone have any stories from real life? I don't have any stories, but um, trying to just think of, you know, I like the, the references in film and I guess popular pop culture. Um, it almost seems like everything is promoting the opposite of Brahmacharya. 
but I can't help but also sort of be reflecting on my previous understanding of Brahmacharya too. Like everything in, in our society system, it's almost seeming like it's trying to uh, stimulate something else to keep keep us distracted from um, seeing Brahma and everything. So it's like trying to to um, stimulate the the physical senses, doing everything to sort of keep us from um, the spiritual practice. Well, I, I think in, in the Western, you know, like uh, within a uh, materialist type of system, capitalist type of system. So I, I thought that was that was pretty interesting. Anyone have any other examples? Uh, I wonder if um, there is a distinct difference between the Brahmacharya concept and uh, and Madhavidya, the second lesson, or is the Madhavidya just the way to grasp Brahmacharya, or or is it something different, or is it something similar? What do you think? I can't tell. I don't have my second lesson yet. Yeah, I mean, on, on the surface, it seems very, very similar. I haven't, uh, well, besides this text, haven't uh, gone too deep into uh, Brahmacharya. But just from what I read in the text and from the second lesson, um, it seems like that's pretty much what it is. But uh, Ditya and um, Nirmo, they they have a lot more experience. What what are, what are your thoughts on that? Is it pretty much the second lesson? Sorry, guys, I'm driving. It's difficult for me to talk. But Madhavidya means, I think it's the application of the principle of Brahmacharya. So they are very interconnected, but I think it's more of a practical aspect. Madhavidya, it both means like honey knowledge means seeing everything as an expression of Brahma. It's either the practical, or how to say, it's the result of the practice and it's the process of the practice itself. So they are similar. In terms of examples, I think the good one is really... The first one was... Uh, it, this principle helped me a lot when I was doing this short film. And I think this principle can take you uh, <laughs> to extreme length. And uh, I was doing this film and I was playing an inmate who was... And that character was raped, raped in his childhood. Uh, when he, he went through a lot and then he was imprisoned for uh, an, an unspecified period of time. And then he was very, very angry. Uh, he was farm uh, how do I say, farmished. He went through a lot of things. And then in the cell, the only friend that he met was a cockroach, Remy. So he got friends, he, he made friends with his cockroach. And uh, they brought the real cockroach on set. It was a, it was a Madagascar cockroach, quite a big one. And uh, it basically went all around my body. And I had to actually make friends with him. He was like my partner. And uh, at first, I was a little bit apprehensive. Like, okay, the real cockroach, I'm going to do it. And at first, the character hates it. He hates it and wants to destroy it wants to just, you know, make it into a pancake or something. <laughs> but then, 
and then they become very close friends. And this principle of Brahmacharya really helped me. I meditated three or four times during shoot during the shoot. And there were lots of problems going on on set. Uh, they were not go, going well on the, on the session. A very uh, senior professor of our director in theater back in Turkey, our director was Turkish, he, he died uh, during the day and the director was very, very stressed. Uh, and the shooting schedule was delayed and mom, I guess many much money were being wasted. Lots of stress when I was on set and I had to focus just on my job. And at the same time, this cockroach was all around. Uh, so I think this principle really helped me to connect with it because it was a life. And I, and I tried to see it as an expression of Brahma. It was a very primordial, old ancient creature, quite intelligent. So that was one of the examples. So in the end, we, we succeeded. Uh, we, sh we shot the film. Unfortunately, there is only a rough draft. Like they never made to the final cut, never came to be for some reason. But that was one example. And I think I will stop with this one. It was one of the biggest ones. So bonding with animals is a big one. I think also appreciating nature, the world scene, the world and nature, trees, but in particular plants and other elements as expression of God of something intelligent i think it's very helpful and it takes your relationship with the world to a more deeper level to a more profound level like dif dif different indigenous cultures they have this appreciation for the world for nature for spirits and they see everything is more interconnected than the society in the west and even though in canada we talk about multiculturalism about diversity it's still strange that we have so much disparity and separation and anxiety because of differences of culture and this and that. So this principle is really deep and it lies at core of uh, indigenous teachings, cultures, not just tantric, but also I think indigenous cultures here in Canada uh, and many others and many others. For sure, and it lies at the core of the holistic education movement, which was started in the 80s or 90s. So it's a very deep principle. OK, I'm done. All right. Thank you. I think we'll, unless anyone has more uh, to say, we can we can move to the next principle, which is about it. Just, just just quickly quickly add on to Nirmal's report. I I, I found mm -hmm. um, intense situations dealing with uh, difficult people lately. Not lately, but since I, I learned the second lesson, uh, it, it really helped me to 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 be able to to navigate those challenging situations challenging people by uh you know implementing the the principle of uh brahmacharya yeah just i just want to add that i have identical experience um as jeppes just mentioned i think after getting this second lesson and starting practicing parma uh, brahmacharya it feels so not uh, not always easy, but so much easier to navigate those kind of situations that occur in every person's life, I think, right? When someone is agitated, someone is emotional, um, to keep your cool, you know, to continue uh, like being a uh, human instead of just starting responding emo emotionally or becoming agitated, for instance. Yeah, so it helps so much, and I feel uh, that it's it to me personally. I think it's one of the most practical, <laughs> practical principle out of those that at least uh, those that we discussed. Thank you for sharing. 
So I have a presentation. And it looks weird. No, oh, it's So I did something similar to what Madame did. A parigraha, uh, in case of enjoyment of any material object, the control over the, the subjectivity is called brahmacharya, while the control over objectivity is a parigraha. Non indulgence. In the enjoyment of such amenities and comforts of life as are superfluous for the pre preservation of life is a parigraha. For our existence, we require food, clothes, and also a house to live in, provision for old age and money, and cultivable land for one's dependents are also essential. Therefore, a number of factors have to be taken into consideration to determine an individual necessity for the preservation of life. It may be that the requirements of any two persons are not similar. It is therefore difficult to determine the minimum requirements for any particular person because it is entirely a relative, relative factor. The society may help individuals to be established in a parigraha by setting a standard in certain spheres of life. The minimum requirement of a person can to some extent be determined and decided by the society. For example, no one shall accumulate more than a certain amount of money, or no one shall possess more than a certain number of houses, and no one shall be owner of more than a certain area of landed property. But the complete establishment in a parigraha ultimately depends on the individual. A parigraha is an endless fight to reduce one's own objects of comfort out of sympathy for the common people. After ensuring that individuals are able to maintain solidarity in their physical, mental, and spiritual lives for themselves and their families. In practicing a parigraha, the objects of pleasure will increase or decrease with person, place, and time. But the definition of a parigraha, as mentioned above, will be applicable to all persons in all countries and at all times. A parigraha, to renounce everything accepting the necessities for the maintenance of the body is known as a parigraha. Those dominated by hungry psychic urges or psychic pabula run after material gains and do not hesitate to exploit others mercilessly. Exploitation starts when one violates the principle of a parigraha, non-indulgence in those amenities and comforts which are superfluous for physical existence, and accumulates more physical wealth than one actually needs for survival and progress in the world. The exploiters forget the bas basic truth that this material world is very limited, whereas psychic fab fabula is propelled by an unlimited urge. When unlimited fabula are let loose in the limited material world, exploitation starts. A few become rich and others become poor. In such a condition, millions die without food, live without shelter, work without education, suffer without medicine, and move without proper clothing. The society then splits into two distinct groups, haves and have-nots. The former is the class of exploiters, the capitalists, and the latter is the class of the exploited, the disgruntled workers of the Shudras. So the unchecked psychic 
urges and psychic fabula for material acquisition and in merciless exploitation. So those were the social aspect of Aparigraha. We shouldn't uh, collect more things that we actually need, uh, that we actually require. And those things that are not our needs are usually our wishes. And wishes um, are not actually necessary in our life. We, we can be completely happy without um, fulfilling all, all our wishes. And we can actually find that by simplifying our lives, by um, trying to um, restrict ourselves a little bit in some places, it, it helps to to notice the thing that the things that we already have uh, that are already present and that already can give us uh, a lot of joy and satisfaction so in um, our individual life or uh, spiritual spiritual aspect of this uh, practice is seeing um happiness in simple things, not in con collecting things, but uh, in this ability to, to find joy in, in something that comes naturally to you without too much, um, too, too much effort. Um, and also, we can notice that uh, those little things like just being, just breathing, just um, being conscious of the fact that we are conscious, it can, uh, can be a very joyful thing. Also, we need to remember that... Uh, to love ourselves it's is our duty so we we still need to uh, provide everything that we need for our well-being but at the same time uh, not to cross this line when it's um we're getting into the zone of greediness Another thing is um, Aparigraha is, is very connected to the principle of Santosha, which we're going to um, learn or read about later. So they are connected in a way that um, when you... you have some constraints you you actually feel more uh, satisfied on a, in a in a different way but in a more deep way and so if you if you follow aparigraha you will follow santosha in some way, because you you will feel satisfied. Um, I saw or heard about an example from Dada Sadananda in his videos about. Um, he says that uh, to be a. Let me translate it. To be an entrepreneur is not not bad, or to be a businessman is not bad. Uh, 
it, it's good if you if you do it with the intention to bring more money into the world to help others rather than to collect this money to for your own uh for your own self for your own well-being so um you can earn as much as you want but you need to keep um to be conscious about why you do it why what are your intentions and uh in the moment when you realize that you start to to do it for yourself only uh, your your mind will get crudified uh, and your consciousness will will not be as pure anymore um because you your only object of ideation will be money so your your consciousness will get crudified it will uh, it will just get material and you won't be succeeding in sadhana so it, it's also important to to understand why you are doing certain things i think that's it for me do you have any questions or stories Well, not, not really any stories. Once again, the, the the reflections I noticed when uh, going over the the text, or you know, I I have come across this. Uh, I guess philosophy in in many many different traditions, and um, it seems like anytime you you try to uh, not promote it, but talk about it put it in a good light you're labeled a, a communist you know where where you're, you're talking about the greater good and you're tra talking about um you know having enough for for everyone you know you're you're labeled um yeah like like a nut type type of thing and hope i don't sound like a, a pessimist or i look at society negatively you know there there's many beauties of our uh life today but um yeah once again it's almost like our way of life today is promoting the complete opposite of a priori god it's it's like to accumulate as much as you can and i've even noticed people who open businesses it has not you know rarely has to do with uh belief in the business it's almost like what type of business can i get in to make the most money type of thing and, and trying to look at uh gaps in the system to try to exploit so yeah so, so so once again i thought it was pretty interesting how uh yeah it just seems like the system it's it's promoting the the complete opposite But I, I do I, understand it. It's difficult for. Uh, oh, sorry, just a final point. Uh, it's difficult for a lot of people who have, you know, families, kids, right? The 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 financial security that might be a main motivation makes it hard. Might make it hard to to not have that as a uh, priority. So once again, I think uh, the the intent in, in the situation probably makes uh, makes the biggest uh, difference. Sorry, I'm. Uh, 
uh, yeah, I just, uh, yeah, I like that. Uh, I, I like this principle a lot, and I like that it goes into politics a little bit, right? Uh, just because you cannot discuss a paragraphal without probably being called a communist or, or worse. <laughs> yeah, but to me personally, um, this principle is is just so crucial. When I when I when I have a thought about getting something, anything like I don't know, new speakers, new headphones, new phone, new I don't know, um, a T-shirt. I always ask myself, do I really need this? Not want, because I obviously want this, but do I really need this? And in the nine out of ten, or maybe I don't know. 95 out of 100, the answer is no. Therefore, I don't buy it. And uh, recently, when I had my birthday, I was asked, so what do you want? I said, I, I don't know. I, I, I don't need anything. I have everything I need, right? And uh, I don't know. Um, I think that's just a great principle to follow. Uh, and I agree that Currently, in the society, we have the opposite agenda to be considered a normal, something that everyone follows, right? So when you see um, a new iPhone comes out every year, right? Everybody wants a new iPhone. It's promoted on YouTube. So everybody wants a new iPhone. And do you really need a new iPhone? <laughs> so, yeah. My point is maybe 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 someone does need a new iPhone, but the idea is um, it I don't know to me personally it helps so much just to navigate these uh, choices uh, when you ask yourself just this simple question. And in terms of the in terms of the I don't know political statement, I think it stands really well. Um, I, I, I don't know. So, I agree that it's really hard to find a job where founders of the company or those who run the company would be really interested in making the society better, right? Just so that would be an idea. It's I try to find such a company. It's almost impossible. Or if you do find such a company, usually you won't be paid for what you do. And in the society, in the structure, society structure where we are at right now, you cannot you cannot work for free, unfortunately, right? <clears throat> we do not have a universal basic income yet. So yeah, that's kind of a conundrum, right? What so what do you do? And I think the to me personally the answer is do the best you can. Like stay away as much as you can from anti paragraph businesses, concepts, uh, people, and, and try to do your best. Um, yeah. What do you think, guys? I'm not sure. Um... Maybe um, it's better to, well, in some cases, stay away, but in some cases, maybe fight mm, against or try to introduce new ideas into this place. But yeah, we need we need more force. For this, not not just one person. Yeah, I agree. But I think in perhaps in uh, you know in the current version of society that we have uh, with current values, you probably need to uh, probably need to be successful, like uh, found a company or something like that. Then you can promote whatever you want. Because it's much harder to promote something in the rigid structure. Um, I don't know. What do you think? Because I, 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 I don't know. Um, 
So currently, for instance, if you want to volunteer 100% of your time at the same time you have a family, or not volunteer, or just work 100% of your time on something that benefits the society, do everything you can. So how do you do that uh, if you if you have certain responsibilities, which essentially lead to financial responsibilities, right? So what? How, how do you achieve that? And the only answer right now, of course, it's to keep searching for something that is really resonates with your values. That's that's obvious. But at the same time, currently the answer is just to get as much money as you can, uh, which would let you uh, not work so that you can start working on whatever you want. You know what I mean? Or start a business that would let you do whatever you want. Or I don't know, maybe you have a better advice <laughs> on that and how to how to follow the paragraph to like the full extent. No, I definitely you know support what you're saying. Um, but the you know the 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 uh, let's say the the desire or the motivation if we were to need to, you know, accumulate as, as much as we can in order to make a difference. I know that process would be definitely very uh, mentally intensive, physically intensive, and concentration and focus is required. But then it, it, it's like, what are you actually concentrating on and focusing on in order to achieve that? So it's almost like the opposite of Ramacharya. It's like, deep down, we have this sort of intent but I know that with the repetition, and if we maintain that sort of mindset, we we can change ourselves, you know, back into sort of what we were not wanting to be. So yeah, it seems like very, very difficult and even to to change the system because I do have examples of people who have uh, who have had influence on the world, who have tried to make a difference. And then they are eliminated, you know. <laughs> just, so I don't know. It almost seems like we 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 need to, um, you know, w work on our on ourselves. Um, and I'm sure that the the on that path, you know, the the answers will be provided on on where to take it next. Um. But yeah, so it's it's more like an in, internal change, like. But yeah, but this is this is definitely a complicated topic. It was very fruitful discussion. We can, we can stop here. And I know um, Nirma wanted to take Shawacha for next time. And perhaps someone wants to take um, Santosha. Because I can take. It's my favorite principle. Then take it. Take it. Okay. Okay, thank you for facilitating. Thank you, Madhuvidya. Thank you, everybody, for joining. Have a good night. See you next week. Namaskar. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.